Um, I'd also just like to uh, start with so, uh, my deep gratitude uh, for the invitation to come here. It's been so beautiful and just amazing to hear all these fantastic papers. Thank you, Sadia. Thank you, Irini. Thank you, Dimitri. Um, where is he? Um, uh, and thank you also to SFU and to Rutgers uh, for their support uh, in, in making this workshop happen. Um, I, uh, I had a little handout and um, I did prepare a, a much more lively and colourful PowerPoint, but perhaps I can share that with you later and we can put it on the website. Um, I also just want to say this is perhaps unlike other people's work today, this is not from a longer project. Uh, in fact, I'm writing a book, um, hopefully nearing the end of a book on decolonization and the Cold War in East and Southeast Asia. Um, but as a side project, um, I've had an interest and I've published um, some work on the refugee, offshore refugee detention in, um, that Australia, the Australian government does. So I've, and that's what I'm um, talking about today. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to actually go back to that research. Uh, and, you know, if Gary was asking us, inviting us to think about the Mediterranean in relation to the Caribbean, my invitation will be to think about it in relation to the Pacific. So midway through Behrouz Bouchani's 2018 No Friend But the Mountains, he provides a poetic inventory of the refugee detention camp on Manus Island, Papua New Guinea, in which he is incarcerated. And this is on the handout. Um, he says, Fox Prison has six main corridors. Each one of these corridors consists of the following. Two open entry exit points, 12 small rooms, approximately one and a half meters by one and a half meters, fly screened windows, four imprisoned individuals in bunk beds, forced to adapt to each other's sweaty bodies in the elimination of personal space, 12 rusted fans facing the same direction, 48 individuals, 48 beds, 48 foul smelling mouths, 48 half naked, sweaty bodies, frightened, arguing. The regimented physical organization of the camp, with everything in neat multiples of four or 12, conveys the dehumanizing prison environment the Australian government officially calls a regional processing center. Bouchani, a Kurdish journalist who fled persecution in Iran, attempted to reach Australia from Indonesia in a small fishing boat in 2013. Intercepted by the Australian Navy, he was briefly detained on Christmas Island, an Australian territory, before being flown to Manus Island, Papua New Guinea, where he remains to this day, now in his sixth year. Uh, and on the map you can see, um, which is not a great map, but Papua New Guinea, and there's sort of coming out on the northeastern side, a kind of string of islands, and Manus is one of those end islands. Um, at, you can't see Christmas Island. Christmas Island is actually on the eastern Indian Ocean, and it's very hard to get maps that actually show both, you know, Papua New Guinea and, um, Christmas Island. Anyway, um, for almost two decades under both Labor and Liberal governments, uh, excepting a hi hiatus between 2008 and 2012, the Australian government has detained several thousand, quote, un unauthorized maritime arrivals, unquote, in offshore camps on Christmas Island and Australian Territory and Papua New Guinea and Nauru, the latter two uh, sovereign, although impoverished, Pacific nations in the region. And you can also see Nauru and how um, far out that one is. The offshore detention regime, just to give you a little bit of background, if you don't know, was inaugurated um, by then Prime Minister John Howard in 2001, who refused to allow some 400 mostly Afghan refugees rescued by a passing Norwegian ship, the Tampa, to enter Christmas Island port. The Navy intervened and they were then taken to Nauru in exchange for debt relief, uh, a package of aid, as well as $400 million. And if you can do the math, that's about $1 million per refugee. Since then, the regime has only become more entrenched. In July of 2013, Labor Prime Minister, then Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, declared that no refugee, migrant or asylum seeker, and I'm using these terms interchangeably, although of course, as you know, there are significant differences. Um, so he claimed that no one would, uh, attempting to arrive by boat in Australia would ever be settled in the country, thus mandating either their return, refoundment to the country of origin, or indefinite incarceration offshore. As of April 2019, there are still at least 1,000 detainees in, off in Australian offshore detention centres. They are Afghan, Sri Lankan, Su Sudanese, Lebanese, Iranian, Somali, Rohingya, Kurdish, Iraqi and Pakistani, amongst some others women and families on Nauru and single men on Manus. Uh, 
and many of them have been there since 2013. In addition to soaring rates of mental health problems, suicide and self-harm attempts, there have been to date 15 deaths in the offshore camps. So back to Buchani. His 2018 publication, No Friend But The Mountains, is the first piece of literary writing to emerge from the Australian refugee detention regime. The book provo provoked a minor literary sensation by winning one of Australia's top prizes last year, uh, the Victorian Premier's Award. Along with his prolific journalism, activism, and a 2017 co-directed film about life in Manus prison called Chilka, Please Tell Us the Time, Buccioni's works have done more than any other to reveal the conditions on Manus. Um, and when I was back in Melbourne um, a few years ago on my sabbatical and I was working with um, a group called Refugee Action Collective, um, I mean, everybody had his phone number and every time we were organising a rally, it would be like, can we get Beruz on the phone? Let's see if we can get Beruz. And so he would sometimes, um, you know, speak via the phone. Um, so he's, he's, he's very prominent um, to, to the activist community. This paper will discuss both his film and his book with the aim of providing a comparison point for what is happening today in Southern Europe. The parallels around what Saski Assassin has described as, quote, the detachment of bordering capabilities from geographic territories, end quote, speak to a need for a trans-regional theorization of the so-called migration crisis. And the need, I think, to understand it less as an anomaly and more the result of interlinked imperial histories, intersexting struggles for decolonization and sovereignty, and the contours of contemporary neoliberal capitalism. So one of No Friend's central achievements is that it emphatically refutes the typical status of refugees as objects of knowledge. As his translator Omid Tofijian points out, Buccioni's writings, quote, produce new knowledge and construct a philosophy that unpacks and exposes systematic torture and the border industrial complex, end quote. In conversation with another collaborator, Buccioni himself has weighed the pros and cons of different theoretical frameworks, from Foucault to Gramsci to Zizek, and he notes, quote, this place really needs a lot of intellectual work, end quote. In this paper, I argue that No Friend is a text akin to some other works we've recently seen emerging from border regimes. And I'm thinking just, for example, Muhammadu Old Slahi's Guantanamo Diary, if you know that. Um, these texts offer a profound theorization of today's border industrial complex. Um, as another reviewer puts it of the book, quote, because those within Manus encounter border policing through its most extreme manifestation, they are in a privileged position to understand the system as a whole, end quote. So more than simply a refugee narrative or a prison diary, although the text certainly includes narrative elements of both, No Friend is explicitly a book of ideas and analysis rendered into a hybrid literary philosophical form. In the first section, I'm going to focus on the genres of No Friend, I'm going to call it No Friend, uh, in relation to the contours and consequences of this detachment of bordering capabilities. In the second section, I'm going to turn briefly to his film, his co-directed film, for its equally profound meditation on the space, time and texture of Manus Prison, as well as what it suggests about the neo-imperial relationship between Australia and its former colonial territories in the Pacific. Um, and we'll see how um, these, these uh, arrangements produce a securitized trans-border space that reconfigures imperial relationships and transforms them into profitable global flows of bodies, labor and capital. So the first section, genres of the borderscape. In a chapter titled Queuing as Torture, Buchani meditates on the endless, stultifying wait under Manos Island's equatorial sun for entry into the mess hall. And this is on your handout. The logic of five. Five people follow on from five people. Then the officer turns to five people on their way out. Next five people. The automated finger signals five people. Another five enter. Five people replace five people. Five enter, sitting on five chairs at the beginning of the queue. The number five, five chairs, five chairs prepared at the beginning of the queue. The rest wait standing in line. Everything is reduced to the number five. The repetition of the word five, the number of prisoners allowed into the building at one time, is both numbing and lyrical. The numeral accumulates a sort of incantatory power of sovereignty over the prisoners who have no other choice than to succumb to its terrible logic. The queue, Buccioni continues, is, quote, a replica of a factory production line. Life itself becomes a production line. The prison has become a replica of a chicken coop, modern industrial, end quote. When read through the lens of the border industrial complex, such dehumanizing treatment is evidence of, of the production not only of suffering on the part of the migrants, but what Suvandrini Pereira has called a borderscape. 
Uh, like Gattrell's term, uh, sorry, like Peter Gattrell's term, refugeedom, although I'm not so keen on that term, the concept borderscape is useful as it resists, I think, focusing on refugees and migrants solely in relation to the states that simply refuse or accept them. Um, with the regional processing arrangement that began in 2001, Pereira notes the peculiar mutations of state, state sovereignty that have occurred. Quote, Australia's border both contracts when outlying territories are excised for migration purposes and expands as the sovereign territory of other states is effectively annexed to serve as detainment camps, end quote. And what she's referring to there is um, in the early 2000s under John Howard, approximately 4,000 small islands, including Christmas Island, around Australia were excised from the migration zone, which meant that if you arrived, you didn't have the previous, the former... Um, um, international rights of claiming asylum, and there was even talk of excising the mainland from the, from the zone, which, how do you do that anyway? Um, Fuccioni's harrowing uh, descriptions of his risky boat journey from Indonesia, in fact, he makes two journeys, the first boat sinks, the second one almost does, his flashbacks to his time in de detention camps in Indonesia mm -hmm. and his eventual arrival on Manus, these are all discontinuous elements that make up the securitized borderscape. Pereira again, quote, the bodies of asylum seekers, living and dead, and the practices that attempt to organize, control, and terminate their movements bring new dynamics, new dangers, and possibilities into this zone, end quote. Bucciani's book and film powerfully reveal how the zone catches migrants within the workings of a larger deterritorialized borderscape, forcing us to see precisely what the Australian government wishes we did not. That Bucciani emphasizes the modern, rational, and industrial nature of the prison is significant for a departure from some portrayals of refugees as simply excluded from the norms of political and social life, that is, as subjects defined simply by their lack of human rights or citizenship. Rather, Bucciani portrays the refugee as a hyper-managed subject. If the border is no longer a physical boundary, but now inscribed onto the bodies of migrants as part of this sort of larger borderscape in the Pacific, this inscription must be constantly reworked, reinforced, and securitized. No Friend discloses the proliferation of bordering and securitizing techniques. Its essential task is to partition, to control, and to separate at every possible scale from the division of bodies in rooms, corridors and camps, and the fact that the men are housed in repurposed shipping containers is indicative, to the way that food, water, cigarettes, medicine and phone time are all rationed and distributed according to arcane and often impenetrable rules. Even the milk poured out at mealtimes meal is subject to a precise military-style economy, the calculation of which the prisoners cannot make sense of. The result is, Bucciani says, quote, every prisoner is convinced that they or their group are critical theorists of the, systematic, of the system, systemic foundation, the chief analysts of the system's architecture, end quote. So it really turns the migrants into um, analysts and critics as well. And such material conditions, I suggest, are reflected in the undecidable genre of the book itself. If Bucciani's daring refugee narrative becomes a detention diary, becomes an analysis of neoliberalized management, it is because the very designations of asylum seeker, migrant, terrorist, and prisoner slide into each other via today's international regime that, as Didier Fassin and Mariella Pandolfi observe, uh, combines both the military and humanitarian at once. The critical observations that No Friend makes are then inseparable from its unruly hybrid literary form. Subtitled Writing from Manos Prison, and Buchani insists on using the terms prison and prisoner throughout, the book was secretly texted out by WhatsApp to a number of collaborators in Australia and Iran who together workshopped the drafts. It was then translated from the Farsi by Tofajian, himself based in Sydney, Manos and Cairo, uh, and then published um, by Picador in Australia. Written in a mixture of prose and poetry, as you've already um, got a sense of, it tacks between explication and theorization, between documentary and the aesthetic. In contrast to the excessively delimited daily existence of its author, its very form seems intent on crossing as many boundaries as possible. Australian writer Arnold Zabel describes the book as one that fuses, quote, poetry, memoir, elements of fiction, social theory, monologues, dreams and nightmares, chants and laments, end quote while Bucciani's translator suggests a number of other genres it belongs to. Clandestine prison literature, philosophical fiction, Australian dissident writing, Iranian political art, transnational literature, the Kurdish literary tradition, and so on. 
Its form, therefore, bears the imprint of the necessarily cosmopolitan conditions of its production. And it evokes, to use Terry Tomsky's words, um, quote, demands for global justice and rights that have long been cosmopolitan, end quote. But it equally draws from Kurdish literature and folk tales and foregrounds the specific cultural and social resources that keep the men alive. These range from satirical music and dance performances, which, quote, revolt against everything, end quote, to the support the inmates give each other to a dramatic near-revolutionary camp-wide protest at the end of the book that pits the detainees against the security forces with tragic results. The book also interweaves philosophical ruminations on everything from Bouchani's early desire to join the Peshmerga to the use of armed resistance versus the value of the pen. No Friends hybrid mediated collaborative and transnational form uh, thus constitutes a finely grained analysis of a multiplex system of oppression, dissecting the camp's operating logic, its varying modes of biopolitical power and outright violence, its transnational labor arrangements, as well as its damaging psychological effects on both captors and captives. Um, in that sense, it has a, also a kind of Fanonian um, tone to it. In analyzing the new 21st century configurations of intervention, aid, and sovereignty, Sandra Mazadra and Brett Nielsen have argued that we must rethink re refugee detention as not merely a crisis of brute sovereign state power exercised over an Agambenian bare life. Uh, and this touches on something that um, Fivos was saying yesterday about management. Although they draw on Agamben's work for its understanding of the way the migrant camp quote, catches its inhabitants in a legal order for the purposes of excluding them from the very same order, end quote. They insist we see such practices as part of the state's management of migration systems and flexible labor markets under pressure from neoliberal economics. Discussing the recent proliferation of camps, detention camps in Southern Europe, Northern Africa, and the Pacific, they adduce that the purpose of such camps, quote, is not simply to prevent or block mi migratory movements in general, but also to regulate the time and speed of migrations, end quote, for the purposes of contemporary capitalism. They describe how immigration practices such as labor benching, uh, which is the withdrawing of certain kinds of labor from the market, and their example is uh, Indian IT workers, so they'll be periodically they'll um, shut down the visas for that, those categories. This, these merely occupy another point in the spectrum of practices that produces the condition of deportability, thereby synchronizing migration with the logic of contemporary capitalism. And I'll just note too that it's not at all that Australia believes it's overpopulated. Uh, the country takes about 200,000 new permanent migrants per year. Um, we must understand migration systems then in relation to a number of governance and security techniques, including the temporal bordering or benching, deportability, detention, short-term protection visas, boat towbacks, which together aim to produce governable mobile subjects from ungovernable flows. As a consequence, we cannot comprehend the critique, uh, we cannot comprehend and critique migrant detention regimes solely via appeals to international law, human rights abuses, and the norms of citizenship. In other words, the categories associated with traditional forms of interstate sovereignty, especially those inaugurated by the 1948 Refugee Convention, to which Australia is a signatory. If Bouchani's narrative de demonstrates the incredible suffering of migrants detained under the al alibi of regional processing, it also confirms Mazadra and Nielsen's insight that the conditions of today's migrant camps are defined as much by the intersecting efforts of intergovernmental organizations, NGOs, and private security companies as they are by the sovereign power to exclude. Deploying a managerial approach to border control and modeled, modeled on the business of crisis management, these agencies are less subject to international law and are guided by depoliticized notions of quasi-legal professional arrange, agreements, standards, best practices, and routines. Uh, that's Mazadra and Nielsen there. Um, one chapter of No Friend is largely devoted to describing the inter, uh, International Health and Medical Services, or IMHS, which is contracted for health services in Manus Camp. Bouchani just depicts the puppet-like appearance of medical workers who in general offer nothing but paracetamol. For those who actually need to see doctors or dentists, an insurmountable rigmarole of schedules, forms, and lists appears. Bouchani thus prefers to have a rotten tooth extracted and cauterized by a local Manusian friend with a red hot wire. Whereas, quote, if I had confronted the IHMS system, my soul would have been engulfed in thousands of IMHS letters, reports, and forms, and then annihilated, end quote. 
we see an even clearer consequence of the shift to a depoliticized managerial mode of border governance following the 2016 High Court of Papua New Guinea decision, which ruled the detention camps unconstitutional and illegal and demanded that they be closed. This should have created a crisis of sovereignty, but in fact, it did not result in any crisis for the management companies and services that run the camps. A number of complex legal wrangles followed while the Australian government predictably tried to say the refugees were now PNG's responsibility. In response to a lawsuit by a detainee who claimed wrongful detention, Australia's own High Court simply ruled that the Regional Resettlement Agreement, the MOU, between Australia and PNG was, quote, not dependent on the lawfulness of government action under the law of a foreign country, end quote. The result was the old camp was closed, new accommodations built, and the hundreds of men are still there. In another section of the book, Bucheni reveals his debt to Kafka's The Trial as he ponders the camp's endlessly bureaucratic managerial structure, and this is on the second page. Um, and I sort of really love this quote. Whatever the question, whoever you ask within the prison, the answer is the same. The boss has given orders. Whenever a stubborn prisoner makes inquiries and finds the boss of that individual who has said the boss has given orders and then confronts that person, that person also responds with the boss has given orders. It is just a pointless effort. All the rules, all the regulations, all the questions about those rules and regulations are all referred back to one person, the boss. It is astonishing how the boss also responds with the boss has given orders, a long chain ascending through the hierarchy. He's also said he's influenced by Beckett. Uh, you can see with that. Uh, in a section of verse, Bucheni then ponders and perhaps even longs for the existence of a place of actual sovereign power or the boss. He imagines, quote, a place with thousands upon thousands of tall buildings, a place right next to the parliament, a place with women and men sitting around the oval conference table, a table with a red finish, end quote. It is precisely the fact that there is no table with a red finish, no single place of political power or responsibility to refer to that makes the system all the more oppressive. Bucheni's analysis of G4S, the private security company contracted for Manus, and we could add similar um, other transnational service providers like Serco and Transfield, is equally astute. Its workforce, he suggests, should be referred to by its real name, Bastard Security Company, mm -hmm. since, quote, you need to be a total bastard to work in a place where you detest everyone, end quote. Yet he well understands its labour as part of a securitised, privatised neoliberal economy, both in terms of the Australian employees, quote, who are mostly overworked and have spent most of their lives working professionally in Australian prisons, end quote, and the local Manusians reluctantly drawn into the border economy and, quote, absorbed into a culture of systemic violence, end quote. Um, and there's also quite a lot about the local um, Manusians um, who he describes, you know, un underpaid, do the, the shitty work in the camps, the, the bottom of the pecking order, but this also creates a kind of alliance between them. So um, the, the, the prisoners and the, the local Manusian workers, you know, share cigarettes and, and apparently do dental work for each other. So Bucciani's careful sustained attention to the material production of the border reveals not just an understanding of the governmentality and uneven sovereignty, uh, as they articulate and dis disarticulate across the body of the migrant. The book's restless tacking between different generic modes and styles, variously philosophic, descriptive, poetic, political, make no friend an indispensable theorization of the borderscape. Moreover, his attention to what the detention system has done to its local host, Papua New Guinea, and more specifically, the Manusians, disclose how Australia's border industrial complex draws upon a longer history of imperial occupations and population management. Um, so the second section is shorter, so let me just um, let's move into that. And it's called, um, They Are Here for Our Care Until They Find a Place. Uh, like much of No Friend But the Mountains, Bucciani's and Arash Kamali Savastani's co-directed 2017 film, Chalka, Please Tell Us the Time, is a poetic meditation on life inside the borderscape. It is ostensibly structured around one aspect of the Manus Island Processing Centre, the solitary confinement block or prison within the prison about which extremely little is known. Chalka is the nickname the Australians have given to this block, a place in which uh, men are taken and abused by the withholding of food, water, blankets and toilets. Yet Chalka, we learn, is actually the name of a local bird unique to Manus Island. Its loud and distinctive call punctuates the film soundtrack and gives shape to the endless time in, in indefinite detention, hence the title. Uh, 
But the narrative is hardly framed as a conventional documentary expose, although there are some witness statements by co-prisoners and a disturbing scene of a detainee who is self-harmed being taken away by the EMT. Much of the film documents the mundane texture of everyday life in the camp. It is beautifully, remarkably shot on Buchani's mobile phone and lingers repeatedly on daily scenes from the camp. We see shift changes when the staff come and go through the tall wire fences, close-ups of Buchani's flip-flopped feet as he stares out beyond the wire fence to a lush tropical beach, forlorn plastic furniture in the makeshift living quarters, and in a recurrent visual and oral refrain, a worker in protective clothing endlessly fumigating the camp from top to bottom. Uh, and I have a, that's a, a, a still from that image. There is no over-narration, no dates, no names, no background stories, mm. no identifying subtitles. There is no sense of time or the time lapses between different scenes, shots, or conversations. And that, of course, is the point. The film presents not the facts, but the poetic texture of life in Manu's prison, both its spatial enclosure and, as Mazadra and Nielsen would put it, its temporal bordering. To do so, the film works as a rhythmic, visual, and auditory essay rather than an expository one. At the same time, a narrative strand of the film slowly works to critically pass the significance of the solitary confinement's nickname. An unnamed Australian woman, we might guess she is a journalist or a lawyer at first, accompanies two local Manusian men around the island. We see the three of them, and this is the bottom picture, we see the three of them smoking and talking in different settings as they discuss the chalker bird. The woman is in fact Janet Galbraith, one of Buchani's longtime interlocutors and the founders of Writers Through Fences, an Australian literary organisation that supports and advocates for detained asylum seekers. Galbraith seems to feign a tourist's interest while the men proudly, at times tediously, explain everything about the chalker bird, when it cries, where it nests, how it survives and why it is the representative fauna of Manus province. They joke that, like the residents, it is a small bird that speaks loud. Only in the final part of the film does Galbraith reveal to her interlocutors that inside the detention camp is a torture cell called Chocka by the Australian guards. One of the Manusian men is visibly upset by the derogatory use of the name of the torture cell, which he calls an abuse of the bird's name and of the Manusian identity. The revelation prompts the film's most sustained dialogue as he goes on to describe the tensions and ill feelings that the camp has brought to the island. Reflecting on the first arrival of the refugees, he asserts that, quote, it is our culture to look after people, end quote, but the number of detainees were too many and created fear in the locals. Um, Goldbraith nods and confirms, quote, they, the Australians, are creating problems for your people too, end quote. Nevertheless, he firmly defends the migrants' right to seek asylum, quote, they are not terrorists, they're not murderers or whatever, they're trying to look for freedom. Now when they're here, there's no freedom because we're threatening them again, end quote. He then asks the obvious question, but it's funny. Why is this happening on such a small, poor province which doesn't have many resources? Finally, after wondering why the abuses are not better known, they agree that the local Manusian employees are probably too afraid to speak out about the torture block for fear of their jobs, of losing their jobs. Like Lesbos, then, Manus is an island where many of the effects and contradictions of the current global moment converge. It does not merely host camps that concentrate people, but is itself a layered site of colonial and migration histories, post-colonial desires and co-optations, and a space highly vulnerable to the effects of debt, uneven development, and now climate change. In my earlier research on this topic, I argued that in sustaining the global organization of security and migration, we see reprised neo-colonial relationships between donors, recipients, and humans who have become the very currency of development aid. Um, but Buchani's No Friend and the film, Choka, reveal the way that the refugees themselves have already theorized and made connections between Australia's exploitative relationship to PNG and Nauru and their own histories of imperial oppression and forced migration. Um, uh, so in thinking about today's specific borderscapes, Buchani's works remind us both of their trans-regional dimensions uh, and that we must understand the long durée in which island spaces have been repeatedly and thoroughly instrumentalised by imperial powers for the control of populations. With regard to Papua New Guinea and Nauru, very briefly, Australia has played a key, although almost entirely disavowed, ro imperial role. And uh, I managed to do my undergraduate's degree in post-colonial literature and did not know this. 
Uh, under a kind of second order colonial rule, Australia administered both Papua New Guinea and Nauru under the League of Nations mandate. And then the UN trustee um, system until Nauru's independence in 1968 and Papua New Guinea's independence in 1975. Australia's hasty departure left Papua New Guinea a vastly underdeveloped new nation whose major industries, coffee, copra and rubber, remained in the hands of the Australians. Meanwhile, in Nauru, aggressive Australian and British strip mining of its phosphate resources left the island with serious environmental degradation, unsustainable debt and a dubious economic future. Uh, and the, the environmental degradation was so great at independence in 68 that the Australian government actually offered to relocate the entire population to a fresh island to start over, uh, which they rejected. Um, as the Tongan scholar and writer Eppoli Hawafa notes, quote, unlike other colonial regions of the world, our political independence was largely imposed upon us. It also came in packages that tied us firmly to the West, end quote. Further, in the 70s and 80s, the Pacific was treated as a Cold War security region, and in another inter-imperial fold, the territorial boundaries put in place by the Dutch, the British, and the Germans remain contested to this day. Um, so if you can see back on that map, um, the line, of course, dividing the island uh, of New Guinea, um, Papua New Guinea refuses to, quest to question Indonesia's sovereignty over West Papua, which is still waging a decolonization struggle. And Papua New Guinea uh, will not give citizenship to some 9,000 refugees from West Papua, most of whom live in remote camps without services. The first wave of those refugees arrived in Manus Island in 1969 and were actually placed in refugee camps at the instructions of the Australian administration. Uh, so even though people have said that, you know, the Australians have created a new refugee problem in a place where there wasn't any, that's not entirely true. In fact, they were already sort of managing it. Okay, so just to conclude. Um. All right, in an evocative narrative section of No Friend, Buchani writes of the psychological toll of a life um, as, um, as occurred during the uh, Iran-Iraq war. He, then his escape to the mountains, his flight out of Iran and eventual detention. Quote, I am disintegrated and dismembered, my discrepant past fragmented and scattered, no longer integral, unable to become whole once again, end quote. Islands for Buchani become a dominant metaphor, both for their fragmentation and isolation, but also for their possible connections. Quote, as I grow older, the images form into coherent islands, but they never lose that sense of fragmentation and dislocation. Life is full of islands, islands that all appear to be completely foreign lands in comparison to each other, end quote. I want to stress here that the islands only appear to be completely foreign lands. Buchani's remarkable attunement in both book and film to the local Manusian predicament is what allows him to make a deep connection to the doubly deterritorialized space of the camp in which he is incarcerated. Um, uh. um, his description of being caught between the Iraqis and the Iranians resonates, moreover, with the local Manusian man's account, which he um, gives in the film, of the World War II battle over the island. Uh, in which the, um, the, the locals are, are fleeing from both the Japanese and the Americans and they don't even know who's dropping bombs on them. Um, a line a little later in No Friend, Buchani's narrator takes us on an imaginative journey of what he calls a mythic topography of the island. Having one night witnessed a brutal beating by G4S guards of a prisoner being held in chalk a block, he turns his attention, antennae-like, to the natural world. Aware of the way that the waves thrash the body of the island, he notes the subtle shifts and crescendos of the crickets, which he calls the shahs of this empire. Because of them, quote, the splendor of the night multiplies, end quote, and the tropical Manusian environment merges with a mythical Kurdish landscape. This landscape posits, quote, a chain of mountain ranges, end quote, connecting the islands of PNG to the milky mountains of war-torn Kurdistan, linking the history of war there to the repeated imperial occupations of the Pacific Islands. His many descriptions of water, of the sovereignty of the waves, reminds us that the transit of refugees across the eastern Indian and Pacific oceans is not limited to those waters alone.